Okay, I'm on. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. After, especially the depending on which social event you went to last night, uh, there's always a concern about being the first talk at nine o'clock in the morning, depending on how good the party was last night. I know the main event is tonight, so I hope to see everyone there. I have a a, a Slido QR code up here. We are going to have a little QA session at the end, so. Uh, just a quick second, scan that with your phones if you want to ask any questions. I know there's people in the overflow room and things like that as well. So if you do have any questions throughout, I will be picking up uh, the Slido at the end there. So, first of all, is everyone in the right room? Is this the talk title you were expecting to see? Um, I'm going to be talking today about how I solved a problem with big data. And I'm talking about something called a Bloom filter, which is a probabilistic data structure and allows you to do amazing things with huge amounts of data with virtually no storage requirements and virtually no processing requirements. And I kind of built this problem that I had myself. And it all started back in around about 2014 when I built a little project. And it was a little project to ingest telemetry from web browsers. I was reading about all of these cool standards and all of these cool features that exist in web browsers that would allow the actual browser of a visitor to your website to send telemetry back to you. Now, the telemetry could be about the performance of your site. It could be about the availability of your site. Do you have some configuration or technical errors happening? Is there a security problem on the page? And of course, as a security person, for those that don't know me, the information about security incidents and security problems happening on the page was a really big thing that I was interested in. So I'm like, wow, if people are coming to my website and the browser's like, there's some kind of security problem, I really want to know about that. And all of this is native functionality built into the web browser. You don't have to deploy any agents or libraries or any code or anything like that. Everything that I'm about to talk about is native functionality built into the web browser. Now, the biggest thing that I was focusing on was mitigating and detecting a very nasty type of attack. So I wanted all of this telemetry to come back if something like this had happened on my site. Now, there's a very nasty type of attack called cross-site scripting, where you end up with some JavaScript in your page that you don't want there and shouldn't have been there. Now, of course, we can all look at this script tag and say, well, I'm pretty confident that I don't want that anywhere on my site. But the browser doesn't know that. The browser sees a valid script tag, and the browser will load the script and run the script. That's its job. Now, cross-site scripting could happen because maybe we forgot to sanitize an output. Maybe we're an e-commerce site and we have a review section at the bottom, right? And someone's like, oh, this product is fantastic. Open script tag, off we go. And then the comment is constantly loaded into the page. The script will constantly run into the page. I see this very frequently as well with uh, query string parameters, right? Like, you know, we're searching for a product. And usually the page, if you search for, you know, car, will come back and say, you search for car. Now, if I search for car, open script tag, source, off we go, the page will contain the script tag. So there's loads of different ways that attackers can do this. They can get hostile JavaScript into the page. Now, we've seen a variety of different attacks over the, year, over the years that do this. And in kind of like 2014 onwards, CoinHive was becoming really popular. CoinHive, for those that don't know, is a crypto mining library in JavaScript. Now, the idea it was a legitimate service. The idea was, you don't want to run ads and privacy invasive things on your website. You load the CoinHive library, and you say to your visitors, look, you can come to my website. You don't have to see any ads, but I'm going to borrow some CPU cycles. I'm just going to mine a tiny little bit of Monero for myself. OK, maybe we could attempt to do that in some you know, legitimate and transparent way. But what the attackers realized was, if I'm an attacker, and I can get my CoinHive library onto your website, all of your visitors mine cryptocurrency for me. And we had crypto jacking. So this was a really big, popular thing because it was such an easy thing to do. Find a cross-site scripting vector, stick the JavaScript library onto as many websites as you can, and sit back and watch your Monero wallet. Now, another one more recently, right through to present day, is a group called Magecart. Magecart have been doing very similar attacks, cross-site scripting attacks. How can I get my JavaScript onto your website? But the JavaScript they inject is very, very simple. It just listens for key presses and sends them as XHR requests to the attackers. And what they do when they're reading each one of those key presses is they're hoping that they're on a payment page. 
So you go to a website, put some products in your basket, go to the payment page, and you type in your full card details, your full card number, expiry, the CVV, the security code, and all of these get shipped off to the attacker because they're just being Ajaxed out the back. And you know, one week, one month from now, you will get a very large surprise transaction on your credit card when the attackers cash out all of the cards that they've stolen. So there's lots of different bad things that an attacker can do once they get JavaScript onto your page. Now, the problem is the browser doesn't know that it wasn't supposed to be there. If the browser sees a valid script tag, it will load it and it will run it. And we have an additional defense mechanism. Yes, we should sanitize our outputs. There are ways to mitigate cross-site scripting in the application. But in security, we like to practice something called defense in depth, which is having more than one solution to a problem. We need more than one mitigation. What if we do accidentally let this one hostile piece of JavaScript slip through into the page? There's something in the web browser that can save you called content security policy. Now, content security policy is a very simple HTTP response header, right? So you set it on your page, you have it here alongside other response headers that you probably recognize, and you deliver it to the browser with the page. So you say, here is the page, and here is my content security policy header that contains the policy. And you have to write a simple policy for the browser to enforce on that page. Now, the thing that most people want to control on the page is JavaScript, because it's the most dangerous thing. You can control images and styles and everything else, fonts. Most people are interested in controlling JavaScript. So you would deliver a content security policy header like this. Now, this is a little bit simple. It's assuming that I only intend to load script from myself, which just means my domain, so scotthelm.co.uk, my, uh, my case. And I also load jQuery from the jQuery CDM. And with this simple piece of information, the browser now knows what I expect to happen. I expect that I will load JavaScript from these two places. And therefore, script that loads from any other place was not supposed to happen. So if we think about the script tag I looked at just a minute ago that was loaded from evil.com, the browser would see that script tag and say, well, evil.com isn't on the list. This wasn't supposed to happen. So I'm not going to load it. And immediately, the attack is neutralized. If it was a keylogger, the keylogger no longer runs. If it was a crypto miner, the crypto miner no longer runs. Whatever the script did, it is now fully neutralized. And this is a really powerful protection and a fantastic kind of last line of defense, right? We're literally doing this in the browser. This is the last line of defense that we have. Now, as I said, you can control everything with content security policy. You can set a default position for content to come from my own site, and then you can expand upon that for scripts, styles, images. You can also control where data goes to with things like the connect source or form action. They control not only where resources are loaded from into the page, but where data can be sent to from the page. So if we think in the context of something like MageCart that I just explained, where the attacker gets script into the page, they listen to the key press events, and they're Ajaxing them out the back, I presume that you don't have a connect source set that allows data to be sent anywhere. And generally, it's going to be to myself or some API that I use. And again, you can prevent, even if you do somehow end up with script in the page, you can stop it from exfiltrating data. So content security policy is super powerful and super flexible. You can do pretty much anything that you would like with it. But there's a bit of a bit of a kind of a gap here, because like I said, this is taking place in the browser. So I have my page, and let's say all of you load the page, you also receive the policy, and your browser looks at the policy and says, oh, that script tag we just looked at, evil.com, it's in the page. Well, according to the policy, it shouldn't be, so we'll block it, and we won't load it. And all of this is happening locally in your client, in your browser. And I'm sat here as the operator of this website, and I don't know that just happened, because it happened in your client. It happened in your browser. So content security policy is typically viewed like this as the solution to the problem. But I don't think that it actually is the solution to the problem, because the problem has actually not been solved. The hostile script is still in my page. Now, the solution to the problem is for me to remove the script from the page. We shouldn't have it there. Browser support for content security policy is great. There is like a 98% chance that all of your browsers will support it and will block the script. So we could say, well, you know, we've pretty much solved the problem. But I don't believe that we have. And in content security policy, 
there is one more feature that you can turn on called Report URI. And this is where I shamelessly stole the name of my company from because I'm terrible at naming things. So I called my company Report URI. And what you can do when you specify the Report URI directive is you can say, when something happens, when a violation happens, something happens that the policy prohibited, and you blocked this thing, I would like you to tell me. I would like you to call out to this endpoint and deliver a violation report. So it's a small JSON payload. And this, to me, is the actual solution to the problem. Because your browser has blocked the nasty thing, the keylogger, the malware, the crypto miner, whatever it was. But until I actually find out and identify how that script got in the page and solve the problem and remove the script, my view is that the problem still exists, even though your browser may mitigate the attack. So when you enable report URI, you can specify a location to send these reports. And these are the reports that we, as a service, process and we ingest through all of our customers' sites. And there are many other pieces of telemetry similar to this that the browser can send. But content security policy, violation reports are by far the number one piece of data that we ingest. And it's a very simple JSON payload. Now, upon receiving this JSON payload, you could look at this and think, right, OK, so this particular visitor, whoever they were, was on this page. The violated directive was script source, so straight away I know this isn't good because there's a piece of script there that shouldn't be there. It gives you the original policy to work with, so you can see what the browser was working with, what policy did we deliver. Perhaps you've changed it since you're going to look at this report at some point in the future. And then it tells you the thing that was blocked. Now, if I received this report, and this was a genuine report, I would immediately spring to action, because this is not good. right? We've got hostile script loading from what is very clearly a hostile domain, trying to do hostile things. Now, when we started the service back in 2014, we were receiving a reasonably small volume of these JSON payloads. So in a, in a good month, we would process somewhere in the region of one million of these violation reports and small numbers of other pieces of telemetry. But the CSP violation reports are the number one thing people are looking for. One million JSON payloads inbound in a month. This isn't too difficult, right? And I made some very early infrastructure decisions around the fact that we weren't processing very many of these things. And then organizations and website operators started to realize, well, actually, you know, it might be cool to know if we have hostile JavaScript. So we'll sign up and we'll do this thing. And of course, as time goes by, the amount of reports that we process goes up. So within a year, we went from processing a million JSON payloads a month to a million a day. This is still what I would say is fairly reasonable, right? One million JSON payloads, process them into a database per day. Not too bad. But of course, things continue. And in 2018, for the first time ever, we hit a million CSP reports coming in from our customers in an hour. Now, last week, when I was doing the final prep for this, this talk is brand new, when I was doing the final prep for this talk, I went and got our actual live production statistics from last week. So last week, on average, on a weekday, because we're much busier in the week when e-commerce websites are busy and active, we process one million of those JSON payloads, on average, every 15.4 seconds. Now, this has required some quite significant changes to our infrastructure over the years. I made some very big mistakes in my decisions early on because I hadn't ever anticipated that the service would grow to this kind of scale. So we've had to kind of you know, re-architect many things and innovate our way out of problems that I created when I founded the company and made some very simple decisions and basically didn't, you know, didn't presume it would ever grow this big. So handling this kind of volume brought with it, and still brings with it, because it's continuing to grow, lots of different problems for us. Now, one of the big things that we do is we normalize those JSON payloads on the way in. We're trying to basically stack them as much as possible. Different browser vendors and different versions of the same browser have their own slight little quirks on how they build the reports. So we try to normalize them as much as possible using our experience from seeing these reports for so long. Our data storage mechanism is actually Azure Table Storage. So it's like the predecessor to Cosmos, if any of you use that. Now, we create little time series buckets every hour for your reports. And then in the UI, when we're querying them and building you know, a report on a given period of time, it's very simple for us to pull out 
the reports for the time period that you specified. So this makes pulling the data out of table storage very easy for us. We deduplicate similar reports because sometimes browsers will have very slightly different interpretations of what happened. Some will include query strings, some won't. So we try and look at what is actually being reported rather than the specific payload and group them all together. So we do as much as we can to simplify the, the JSON that's coming in. Now, the problem with CSP that most of our customers face is that it's actually quite noisy sometimes. Let's say a visitor goes to your website and they have a browser extension installed. And the browser extension changes the font on the page because they like a different font. Fair enough. The browser extension, when it loads the font, is supposed to check to see if there's a content security policy and then make an addition to the CSP to say, I'm going to load a font from wherever. Now, most browser extensions don't do things like this. And they'll just inject the font into the page. And then the font will trigger the CSP because that font source wasn't allowed. And we get a report. So we do a lot of work around trying to just drop these before we process them. Because we look at it right at our edge and say, this looks like it was triggered by a browser extension. Let's just throw it away as fast as we can. And then we don't have to put it through our processing pipeline. But one of the biggest problems that we have is this last one. And this was really the problem that I was trying to solve. Because right now, and again last week when I checked, we have 6.4 terabytes of JSON in table storage. And we only have a 90-day retention policy. And one of the most common things that our customers ask us and want to know is alerting for a new event, a new CSP violation that we have not seen before. So a JSON payload comes in, and they basically want to know, have we seen this report before? If this is the first time that we've ever seen this thing, we want some kind of special notification. Now, this is very difficult to do, even if we were to just query over table storage, because we have huge quantities of data. So for every single report coming in, if we were to look into the database and say, have we ever seen this report before? And we're processing in the region of, like at peak, about 68,000 JSON payloads a second, it becomes very difficult to do that. But then when you factor in that we only have a 90-day retention and we do actually delete data at 90 days, it becomes impossible to answer this question. Because the only question we can kind of really answer is, have we seen this report before in the last 90 days? Because we don't have any visibility going further back than that. So it sounded like a really simple question. And it actually proved to be really difficult for us to answer fully this question. Have we seen this thing, this report, before? So I started investigating for solutions, like how can I, how can we do this? Like how could we possibly query to see if we have a piece of data that we don't have, right? Because the 90-day retention makes this virtually impossible. And how can we do this at the volume and scale of our inbound reports? Because we don't, we don't queue reports and process them later, we process them in what we refer to as near real time. When a JSON payload comes in, we have it in your dashboard on average in about 12 seconds. So, you know, we want to be able to do this quickly and immediately as the reports are coming in. And this is where I arrived at a data structure called a Bloom filter. Now, a Bloom filter is what we call a probabilistic data structure. And I'll explain the probabilistic term later. But for now, I'm going to show you how a Bloom filter operates. So as we can see here, I have a Bloom filter. I've called it Bloom. And it is essentially a single dimensional array of bits that are all initialized to 0. We have the width value there of 10. You can see the index for each bit. And we're going to insert an item into the filter. So with a Bloom filter, you take any items that you have, whatever they may be for us, those JSON payloads, and you can insert them into the filter to later query them out. <laughs> Now, to insert something into the filter, we need to set bits at appropriate locations. And to determine the location, we use a hash function. Right now, I have two hash functions that I'm going to use to insert. So k equals 2. I'm going to use two hash functions to insert an item into this filter. My filter is very small for demonstration purposes. Bloom filters will typically be much wider, but they are still only a single dimension. So for me, k equals 2 because the filter is very, very small. k will increase as the size of the filter increases. And we have here, as you can see, hash function 1 and hash function 2. And it would go all the way up to hash function k, however many you have. So a CSP report 
will come into our service. One of these JSON payloads will come into our service. And we need to insert it into the filter so that it's in there and we can query against it later. So inserting an item is relatively simple. I'm going to insert item A, any arbitrary item that you want to put into the filter. So what we do is we take the first hash function, hash function 1. We're going to hash item A. We modulus the result with the width to bring us into a range to give us an index, in this case, 2. So we now know that we're going to need to set the bit at index 2. And because we have two hash functions, we repeat this again with the second hash function. So we take the second hash function, hash item A, modulus it with the width to give us the index at 4. So the Bloom filter will now look like this. We've set the two bits at the appropriate locations in the filter. So then the next report comes in, right? We've now got item B. So our Bloom filter still has those two bits set for item A. They're set in the in the array, and item B comes in. The next CSP report, we want to insert it into the filter. Same process, right? We take the first hash function, we hash the item, mod it to the width, it gives us an index of 6. We also take the second hash function and do it again. It gives us an index of 9. So we set the bits, right? There's bit 6 been set in the filter, and there is bit 9 set in the filter. So these two items have now been inserted into our Bloom filter, and the Bloom filter looks like this. Now, of course, the usefulness of the filter is being able to query against it to say, like, have we seen this item before? So let's say the next CSP report comes in, item C, some other different item that we have never seen before. And we want to query against the filter to say, have we seen this thing, item C? So we repeat most of the process of the insertion. We take the first hash function, we mod it with the width, gives us the index of 4 to look up, and we can see that the index of 4, the bit, was set. So it tells us 1, the bit was set. Then we take the second hash function, and we hash item C, mod it with the width, index 7, look it up, the value is 0. We can now say that we have definitely not seen this item before ever. Because if we had seen item C before, then bit at location 7 would have been set in the filter. So because one of the bits was not set, or any of the bits, or all of the bits are not set, you can say, we have definitely not seen this thing before. This is absolutely brand new. Because if we had seen it before, and we'd done the insertion process with item C, the bit at index 7 would be set in the filter. So this is a very quick way, because the Bloom filter is clearly small enough to be stored in memory, makes it very fast to query against. This is a very quick way to say, we have never seen this thing before. Now, even if we take the JSON and put the JSON in the database, and then in 90 days from now, we purge the JSON from the database because the 90-day retention policy has passed, we can still query against the filter because now we would insert the bits at position 7 to set item C and say, we have now seen this item. One year from now, if we perform this query, it will still say, we have seen this item before because we would have set the bits. So even long after we've purged the data, no matter what our retention policy was, we could come back and query and know, have we seen this item before? But of course, the keen-eyed looking through this may notice that we did say that bit 4 was set. And bit 4 was set because we inserted item A. So now let's query a different item, right? Item A, set the bits at 2 and 4. We query item D. So item D is another new item. We've never seen it before, and we're going to query the filter. Right? We have not inserted item D. You've all been watching. So the first hash function gives me an index of 4. I'm going to look up the index at 4. The bit is set. The bit was set from earlier when we inserted item A. And then I'm going to take the second hash function. It gives me index 9. And I look up index 9, and the bit is set. The bit was set when we inserted item B. And now we have the probabilistic nature of a Bloom filter being shown. Because there are things called hash collisions. When we hash different items, they may, of course, yield the same index in the array to check. So here, because of a hash collision with hash function 1 with item A earlier, we've arrived at an index of 4. And because of another hash collision with hash function 2 with item B from earlier, we now believe that this filter contains this item. This is the probabilistic nature of a Bloom filter. It is a probabilistic data structure. And when you ask a probabilistic data structure, like a Bloom filter, and there are several more that we can talk about, 
a question. You ask it the question, is this item in the set of all items that you represent? So we insert all the reports into the filter, and we say, is this report in the set of all reports that we've ever observed? And a balloon filter can only give you two, question, two answers to the question. But the first one is this. Definitely no. If one of those bits, any of those bits, all of those bits are not set, we know that we have definitely 100% not seen this item before. And that is a really crucial thing for us. Have we seen this report before? No, absolutely not. You need to treat this like the first time you've made the observation. Now, the other answer to the question, have we seen this before, is of course yes. But it's slightly different to yes. Because it's yes, with a very small probability that this is a false positive. Because as we just saw with item D, you can query the item against the filter, and the bits could have been set by other items being placed in the filter. So it is possible for a Bloom filter to give you a false positive. But it's never, ever possible to give you a false negative. Now, for us, if we have the definitely no answer, we have definitely not seen this before, we know immediately that we have some action to take now. We don't need to go query over the data set and do other things. We know with a quick query, quick query to the filter in memory, we know that we've never seen this before. And this is the thing that we were looking for. Now, the probability of getting a false positive, of it saying, yes, we have seen this before, you get to control that. You get to control what is the chance of having a false positive. So it's not you know, some random chance that you, you can't do anything about. You can control very specifically what is the chance of the false positive. So when you come to set up your Bloom filter, there are a few different things that you can do to control that. You can, of course, control W, the width of the array. How wide is my bit array going to be? How many bits do I need? You can control N. Now, if you can't control n, you need to at least be able to reasonably predict n, right? You need to have a rough idea, because you need to know, well, how many things am I going to insert into this filter? Now, if you imagine my filter of width 10 a moment ago, if I insert 100 items into that, all of the bits would have been set, and then the filter is useless. So you need to be able to take at least a reasonably accurate guess at what n will be. So we had a pretty good idea of how many distinct reports we were going to see. You also then get to control K. How many bits am I going to set in this filter for each item? How many hash functions am I going to use? And the last thing is P. What is my desired probability of there being a false positive? Like, is it really, really important that the false positive probability is low, or is it not kind of too bad? That depends on your use case, but you get to define it. You get to control it. Now, in order to calculate these values, generally what you will do is pick one or two that you want to set and control, and then the other two can be derived from the two that you've picked. So we know how many items we're going to insert, and we know what our desired probability of false positive is. And from that, we can determine, therefore, what should be the width of the filter and how many hash functions we should use. So depending on which values you start out with, and I know this might appear like terribly complex and awful, there are fantastic calculators online, right? You literally go and just say, oh, we want a 1% false positive probability, and we're going to insert 1 million items. And it will just tell you what the other two values need to be. So you know, if this looks a little bit too unapproachable, like it does for me, I just go online to the Bloom filter calculator and punch the values in. So we don't need to be some kind of like crazy math whiz. But as you can see, the width, the calculation for the width includes n, the number of items. You can see p, the probability. So of course, how, as we insert more items, it, it needs to be wider to give us space. And as we reduce our desired probability for false positives, we need more width again. So of course, those two things push the width up. If you look at n, the number of items that you're going to insert, you can see k, the hash functions, w, the width. Again, like if we have a larger n, number of items being inserted, we need a larger width in order to accommodate the fact that we're going to be setting more and more and more values. K, the hash functions that we're going to be using. Width and number of items are the two main components. So all of this makes perfect sense when you think about it. If you declare the couple of values that you want, which for us was n, we know how many items we're going to insert. Rough estimate, it's like 7 billion. And P, how much chance of a false positive do we want? 
So you can literally then just take your values and calculate what should be the dimensions of our filter. Now, we estimate with some projection into the future that we will have seen in a region of 7 billion distinct reports. Now, we process about 400 million reports a day, but the vast majority of them can be normalized and deduplicated. So when you're inserting into a filter, it's the number of distinct items. So we recommend being reasonably accurate with this, and we came out at 7 billion items. So how big should our array be? Well, the other value we picked was our false positive probability. So we want a 1% chance that it will give us a false positive. Remember, it's always 0% chance it's a false negative, always. So we want a 1% chance of false positive. And then from this, we can just calculate the width. It will just tell us like how wide should our filter be. So dead easy, you just substitute in the values, and then it will tell you you need a width of this many bits. Now, obviously, there's a couple of bits of overhead in the filter as well. And it came out and it said to us, you need a filter that is approximately 8.4 gig in size. Now, this sounds enormous, and this is enormous. However, we looked at this and I was like, well, it's kind of pretty big, but is it really that hard to come across like eight and a bit gig of RAM nowadays? So I went onto DigitalOcean, our hosting provider, and I was like, I need a server to run a Redis cache, because we keep our Bloom filter in Redis. And they were like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, you can get a, a server with like four processors and 16 gig of RAM, and it's like $9 a month. And I was like, oh. That's actually pretty reasonable. So I was like, oh, I was like, you know, I was like, it immediately kind of like shocked me because I was like, gosh, 8.4 gig of memory. But then I was like, actually, you know what? Like, this is super easy, right? This is really, really cheap to come across a machine with that kind of RAM. So we now have a very, very small dedicated Redis cache that holds our Bloom filter because it's just a bit array. So super simple, super easy. So we knew N, we knew P. That allowed us to calculate W, the width. And it also allows us to calculate k, how many hash functions should we be using? Basically, how many bits should we set in the filter for each item? When we do an insertion, the number of hash functions we use is the number of bits that we're going to set. So we now know the width. We know the number of items we're going to insert. That allows us to calculate k. Very, very simple, right? Just substitute in the values that we already know. And it tells us k equals 7. So I was like, sweet, we're going to use k equals 7. And I put that into my config. So we're going to use seven hash functions to insert into our production filter, which means we're going to set seven bits. Now, as I said, you don't have to do all of this wild you know, kind of mathematics yourself. There are these really great Bloom filters online, and you can just go and punch in whichever number you know or want to control, and then it will just tell you what the other number should be. So I did that and then just copy and pasted the cool maths into my slide to look clever. So I don't, you know, I don't think it needs to be any more complicated than this. We now have this filter up and running in production at Report URI. For testing purposes, we're not currently depending upon it. We're currently testing and experimenting. Because, for example, our value of n is an educated guess. We don't know in history like how many distinct reports we've actually seen, because it was a ridiculously difficult thing to track. We would have had to have kept all data for all time. Now, given how many terabytes of data we have just for the last 90 days, I, I dread to think how much data we would have if we had kept all data from 2014. So right now, we're testing this. We're creating a filter. We're assuming that we will be you know, inserting in the region of 7 billion items. The problem is if you exceed n, if you go above n and say, OK, we want 7 billion items, and then you get to 7.5 billion or 8 billion, it starts to have a very large impact on your probability for false positives. Because if you're overpopulating the bits that are set, you're going to start getting more and more and more false positives. If we think about my width 10 array from earlier, by the time we've inserted 100 items into that, every bit will be set and everything will be yes. It will be a false positive. So n does need to be kind of accurate, which is why we're still testing this, because we don't actually know for sure what n is. So for us, this is what we use a Bloom filter for. A report comes in. And we have one global service filter that we call it. So it's for us as a service. Have we, as a service, ever seen this single report before? And we query it against the filter. And if it comes back and says no, we're like, this is the first time that we, as a service, have ever seen this report. And then we set the bits in the filter. So obviously, next time we know that we've seen it now. Then we operate a per customer Bloom filter, which is much, much smaller, because it's only for your reports. So we then query against the per customer filter 
Now, of course, if we have never seen this as a service, what we're checking and testing is you should never have seen this as a customer. But of course, we may process very similar reports, but the document URI should always make them unique per customer. So you should also have not ever seen this individual report before. This is a good way of, of kind of double checking. So we're going to hopefully use this very soon. It's currently deployed. We're currently testing. And for us, that is our use case. But of course, the question is, what else can you use these for? Like, What else is a Bloom filter good for? We have a very specific use case that's good for us. But many other companies, many other organizations use Bloom filters. When I started reading about these, there were lots of good case studies and real-world examples of Bloom filters being deployed. I read a particularly fascinating white paper from Akamai, who is a large CDM provider. So they reverse proxy thousands, millions of websites. They cache assets at the CDN edge. So then if the browser requests them, the CDN has them cached. If you're proxying and caching for millions of sites, your cache is enormous. Now CDNs, Akamai, realized they had a problem with something called a one-hit wonder. Now a one-hit wonder is an asset that someone, a browser, requests, and then the CDN caches it. They fetch it from the origin, they cache it, and they serve it to the browser and they've put the item in the cache, and the item stays in the cache until it expires and no one else ever requests it again. And they're like, you know what? It doesn't look like you have an app named browser. She's listening to me. <laughs> I, I don't know what I said that woke up the lady whose name shall not be said, but she's listening. Um, that item went into the cache, and it could have not gone into the cache because it was a one-hit wonder. It's only been requested once it goes into the cache and it sits there till it expires, and it's doing nothing except waste space in the cache. So. Akamai were like, hey, we can put a Bloom filter in front of this. So they put a Bloom filter in front of their cache. And when a request comes in, they say, have we seen this request before? Has someone requested this asset before? And if the answer is no, no one has ever requested this asset before, they fetch it from the origin and serve it to the browser and don't cache it. Because we've never seen this before. It's the first time it's ever been requested. Don't cache it and set the bits in the filter. Now, if someone comes back a second time, and they say, OK, has anyone ever requested this before? They can say, yes, because the bits are set in the filter. This time, we'll cache it. So all their Bloom filter does is prevent an item being cached on the first request. It means that all items will be cached from the second time that they're requested. And they manage to reduce the size of their cache by almost three quarters, because the vast majority of assets were being requested once, cached, and then never used again. So by putting a very simple Bloom filter in front of their cache, they managed to shrink very significantly the size of their cache. But Akamai aren't the only organization using Bloom filters, of course. Is anyone familiar with Google's safe browsing? You open a page on your browser, and there is a very good chance that the URL has been checked to see if it's malicious. Safe browsing works across pretty much all Chromium-based browsers. And the safe browsing data set is also used in other non-Chromium-based browsers as well. So I open a, a URL in my browser. I go there. And of course, like I want to know, is this a known malicious URL? So how could we do that? Well, I could take the URL. I could ship it off to some Google-owned API and say, hey, I want to go to this URL. Is it in a list of like malicious URLs? That kind of sounds a little bit like widespread tracking and some pretty privacy-invasive stuff to me. So of course, that's not an acceptable solution. So Google take their list of known malicious URLs, and they generate a Bloom filter. And they insert all of those URLs into the Bloom filter. And then they ship the Bloom filter down to the browser. So inside all of your browsers, probably, there is a Bloom filter. And when you go to a URL and you hit Enter, it queries the URL against the Bloom filter locally in your client and says, is this URL in the filter? Is this URL in the list of all known malicious URLs? Now, the Bloom filter can only tell us two things, definitely no or probably yes. Now, if it says definitely no, we're good to go. right? We know 100% for sure this is not a known malicious URL. And hopefully, the vast majority of the time that you're visiting URLs, that's the answer that you will get. But every now and again, you're going to click a link. And have you seen like that big red thing in the browser when it's like deceptive website ahead? You just queried a Bloom filter, and it said probably yes, probably yes. Now, is probably yes good enough to stop you visiting a URL? Because the URL that you're visiting could be malicious, or it could have been a false positive. So that's the point at which it does reach out and perform a query. 
Now, it doesn't query in the way that I suggested. It doesn't take the URL and send it to the API, because that would be super privacy invasive. Is anyone familiar with Troy's Have I Been Pwned? Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned.com, quick show of hands. So in Have I Been Pwned, there is also pwned passwords, where you can type in your password and see if your password is in the list of all publicly disclosed passwords. And in that, Troy uses a model called K-anonymity, which is the ability to query an API to see if it has an item without telling it what the item is. And that's what Safe Browsing also does. It uses exactly the same model to then query the API using k-anonymity to say, is this URL in your list without telling them what the URL was? It's really interesting and fascinating. Have a read of Troy's blog post on k-anonymity. If querying an API for something without telling it what the thing is sounds kind of impossible, but it, it works. So this is what Safe Browsing does. The vast majority of the time, you'll query that local Bloom filter, and it will say, definitely no. This is not a malicious URL. If it says possibly yes, that's when you do the query. But because that's such a small amount of the time, we've saved the vast majority of the work again. You're not querying every URL. Even though it's k-anonymity and it would be privacy preserving, you still don't want the cost of sending an API request for every single URL you visit. And that's what the Bloom filter prevents. Now, another really good example of this, have I read this news article before? Do big news websites want to store like a, you know, just a full-blown list of every news article I've ever read per user? Probably not. So Medium talked about their example of using Bloom filters on a per-user basis to keep track of whether or not they should suggest an article to you. I go to the home page. I'm logged in. It knows who I am. And it's like, what should we suggest to Scott to read today? It's like, well, these are the most recent you know, popular news articles. So we'll take the URL. We'll query against the filter of articles that Scott has read. And if it's not in there, definitely no. Then we'll suggest it to him. You should read this. It looks pretty cool. If the filter comes back and says, Scott has probably read this article, they go, OK, move on to the next one. And we'll suggest this one. Now, there are many other examples of organizations that use Bloom filters. There's a particular large social media platform that uses them for uh, username registration, right? You go to the website and you say, I want to register with this username. And they're like, do we want to query over like 9 billion entries in the user table? Or do we want to just query against the Bloom filter? Has this username been registered before? Definitely no. You can take it. Probably yes. OK, now we need to go check the database. But it stops you querying the database, doing the very expensive thing in a very large amount of scenarios. And of course, us. We're now using Bloom filters quite extensively at Report Your Eye, because we process volumes of data that would just be unmanageable for us to do at the scale and the speed that we want to. And the, the, like the low speed complexities of Bloom filters is amazing. Right? We keep our filter in memory, in Redis, and we can query against that unbelievably quickly. The, the time complexity of an insertion, these hash functions are super, super cheap. So even if you, obviously, you need to perform the hashes to query the item, you need to perform the hashes if you want to then go and set the bits. The time complexity of that is so low, it's negligible. So they're ultra fast, and they're ultra space efficient. I know 8.5 gig of RAM might seem like a lot, but when you think about what we're actually querying over, that's really quite a low overhead. Now, the other cool thing about Bloom filters and the, the method that I just explained to you is they are the base component of many other probabilistic data structures that can give you different features depending on what you want. Like, for example, we can insert a report and say, have we seen this report, yes or no? What we can't say is, how many times have we seen that report? The Bloom filter doesn't know that. The Bloom filter only knows, have you seen it before or have you not seen it before? But there are counting Bloom filters, right? Maybe you want to query it and say, have we seen it before? And if we have, how many times have we seen it before? So counting Bloom filters allow you to get an idea of the frequency with which you have observed the item. So same probabilistic nature. It still cannot give you a definitive in both ways, in the, the yes or the no. But you can give the, the counting Bloom filter a threshold and say, have we seen this item before? And is it above or below this threshold in terms of its count? So it can say it is possibly greater than or equal to your threshold, or it is definitely less than your threshold that you queried with. So same kind of probabilistic nature. If you think about it, the possibility of being over the count is because other insertions may have collided and artificially increased the count of the item you queried for. 
but insertions can never decrease the count, right? Like we're only ever increasing the count of items. So what we're saying is basically, yes, we know that we've seen it, but we may have possibly overestimated how frequently. Maybe you put an item into the filter and think, well, later, what if I want to delete an item? Because again, if you think back to our example, it's very difficult, virtually impossible, to delete an item from a Bloom filter. Because if you delete the bits for this item, you've also deleted the bits for other items as well. And that's where cuckoo filters come in. Again, very similar concept. Basically, a Bloom filter with the possibility to delete items. Now, if you want more accurate counting, we then have something called a sketch. And this particular implementation is a count min sketch. Now, all a sketch is is a two-dimensional Bloom filter. Right? The one I showed you before was one-dimensional. It's just really, really wide. A sketch is a two-dimensional Bloom filter. So instead of hash function 1 and hash function 2 inserting onto the same row, hash function 1 and hash function 2 would have their own rows. Now we call it a sketch. We are also using a count min sketch at Report URI to do frequency analysis on our inbound reports. Sketches refer to them as events. So as every single report comes in, as every single piece of data or telemetry or whatever it is that you might want to track, you insert it into the sketch. Now again, sketches are far more accurate than a counting Bloom filter, but they're still probabilistic. You still can't say that we know the count precisely, because there is always the possibility of overcounting. Now, because we've separated hash function 1 and hash function 2 into their own rows, that makes the count more accurate. And with a sketch, if you want to increase the accuracy, you can add more and more rows. So as k increases, the number of rows increases. And that makes each count that you stored in each row more accurate. I say more accurate, not accurate. Now, it's called a count min sketch, because if you're storing seven counts for an item, and you say, how frequently have we seen this item? And you pull out the seven counts. The lowest one, count min, is the most accurate, because the others have all been artificially increased in count by collisions. So that's why it's called a count min sketch, because we take all the seven counts. The lowest one is the closest to accurate. And we've tested with this. Again, as you can see on the bottom, you can define your tolerance to overcounting, make the arrays wider, and you can define the probability of being within tolerance, make the sketch deeper. So you can control how accurate do you want the count to be. Now, for us at Report URI, our tolerance here is quite low. We just want to get an idea of, like, is this thing really, really big and frequent, or do we see this twice a day? We don't want exact numbers. We want an impression. We want a feeling for the data. Is it a big, frequent item, or is it a small, infrequent item? And then the one that we do actually use in production is called a top K. So again, this is based on a sketch. It's just a two-dimensional Bloom filter. And this allows you to feed through a stream of events. And on an ongoing basis, it will maintain a list of the top k items, the top however many you define. So in top k, the k is how many items do you want to track in the top 100. So we run a top k, top 100. We want to track the 100 most frequent items in this data stream. And you feed the data stream through the top k structure. And it will always maintain a list of the 100 most frequent items passing through the data stream. It does that by running a sketch, and on top of the sketch to the side, it runs a binary min heap structure. So every time an item comes through, we increment its count, we check how big it is, and we look at the top 100 and say, is this one now bigger than the smallest one, right? Like, is it, if it's bigger than the smallest one, we need to go put it in our list of top 100 and evict the bottom item. Now, doing data analysis like that when we're processing 60 to 70,000 reports a second is incredibly difficult. And we deployed Top K on our like $9 a month Redis cache in DigitalOcean. And we can now look at our data stream of tens of thousands of CSP reports a second and say, right now, like, what are the big hitters? What's happening? If an item jumps straight up to the top of the top 100 or rockets up the list, then we get an alert to say, look, a new item has just jumped itself straight to the top. Maybe one of our customers has a new piece of JavaScript, it's being reported super frequently, it goes to the top of the list, and we're like, maybe we can reach out to them and say, hey, <laughs> you know, is everything OK? Maybe it's a configuration error. It's very popular with CSP, right? We added a new font, but we forgot to allow it in the policy, and now it's being blocked by everybody. And we contact them and like, hey, you have a, a configuration error that you need to fix. Now, the final one is a hyperlog log. Top K does require a little bit more storage space and a tiny little bit more processing than a hyperlog log. 
a hyperlog log tracks something called the cardinality of data in a stream. Basically means, is a bunch of the data the same, or is all of the data different to the rest of the data? How unique is the stream? Are you seeing thousands of events a second with low cardinality? It means they're all the same. If you're seeing thousands and thousands of events a second with high cardinality, it means they're all different. That's all cardinality means. Now, a hyperlog log can take any stream of data and calculate this with like, you need like eight kilobytes of storage. It's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely wild. Like how small an overhead it can be to run a hyperlog log. So again, if you're processing data in a stream, events in a stream, and you want to know like, how unique is the data, are we just seeing a bunch of repetition, hyperlog log is where you're going to go with that. So the Bloom filter and the principles that I explained are the base structure for many of these additional probabilistic data structures. We already use top K. It's phenomenally awesome. We're currently testing account min sketch as well to give us more ideas on a per user basis about the volume of reports being consumed. Now, of course, we already track all of these things in our database, but talking to the database is a lot slower and a lot more expensive than doing a quick query against Redis in memory. So it's about taking as many opportunities as we can to use something local with Redis and do something quick with a minimal overhead. The space complexity, low storage, time complexity, minimal overhead to query it. And all of these data structures have helped us. In probably the last three or four months, I have detailed blog posts on all of them if you really want to dig into this and have a look at other use cases for them. But for now, I wanted to make sure that I definitely left some time at the end for Q&A. So I'm going to wrap up my talk. The Slido link was there. And thank you very much. So let's fire up Slido, see if anyone was brave enough to ask a question. Oh, wow, OK, so we've got quite a few in here. Let's go. If your estimates for the Bloom parameters turn out to be wrong, would you be able to replace the filter with another without breaking the functionality? That's a fantastic question, and the answer is no. The dimensions of the filter cannot be changed after you have created it. The width is set. If you were to adjust the width, it would throw out the index for every single item you've ever inserted, thus rendering the filter useless. So the width cannot be changed, and the number of hash functions, k, cannot be changed. They must be accurate when you create the filter? Very good question. Uh, what hash functions do you use for the reports? Your implementation will usually dictate this for you. So the Bloom filter implementation in Redis uses Murmur, which is, I mean, you may be familiar with hash functions like MD5, SHA-1. They're very expensive. You want the cheapest hash function possible. So it depends on your implementation, but we use Murmur. Uh, what type of scripts do you have on your top 100 reported to report URI? Another good question. So, there's two distinct categories, like number one, oh crap, we have a problem, and number two is like, oh crap, we have a problem, but it's a configuration error. So the, the majority of the time, it's like one of our developers added a new font or a script or a style, and someone forgot to add it to the policy, and then we deploy it, and the policy just blocks it, and we get a huge amount of reports. The other one is like, we have some script that we shouldn't know, you know, we know shouldn't be there, and now we have an issue that we must go investigate. But I would say the configuration error one, like far outstrips the genuine security attack one. What stops a malicious agent from destroying your Bloom filter? Um, we're running it locally. So we have our own like private network at DigitalOcean that all of our servers sit in. We run a dedicated Redis cache for all of our probabilistic data structures. And it's protected as much as the rest of our application is. So hopefully nobody's going to get anywhere near our Bloom filter, because it means you're pretty deep inside our organization. Um, <laughs> a slightly unrelated question. Will trusted types for CSP come to securityheaders.com? So securityheaders.com is another little side project of mine. Check it out. Uh, whoever asks that, the answer is yes. When I find some time to sit down and write some code, um, I will update that. Uh, another question here. Will your Bloom filter will eventually be filled, right? And when? Um, so yes, like I guess more specifically referring to my implementation, I said 7 billion. So 7 billion was the n, the number of items that we used to determine the width. Um, yes, like that filter will eventually be filled because you know if hopefully like the service still exists like years and years and years and years from now, we will eventually get there. The current implementation, as I said for the Bloom filter, like we're currently testing that. We're, you know, we don't actually know that 7 billion is accurate. You know underestimate or overestimate, because we've never actually tracked before the number of distinct reports. 
So we did some analysis on our previous 90 days of data, did some extrapolations, and guessed at 7 billion. So hopefully for us, like once we've completed our testing for a period of time and we're tracking you know, like distinct reports per month, we can make a much better estimate. But if we've hugely underestimated N, and we end up with like you know, 90 billion distinct reports, then yeah, our balloon filter is going to be pretty useless pretty fast. But it's, this is a bit of an experimentation process for us right now. Uh, another good question here. Is the balloon filter a single point of failure for your data stream? Um, no, not the way that we've architected it. The query against the balloon filter and the insertion into the balloon filter can all fail for absolutely any reason they want, and we just continue doing what we did before. Same for the top K insertion. We fire the event to process it into top K, and then we're like, OK, off we go back down our processing pipeline. So it doesn't matter whether you know, it succeeds, whether it fails. We don't want those to impact our current processing pipeline. So they're all bolt-ons. They're all... Um, they can all fail miserably, and everything will still work just as it did before. For your parameter k, how do you pick k hash functions such that they are sufficiently different? That's a really good question. So all of the hash functions that you use to insert into the balloon filter need to be what we call pairwise independent. So if I use seven hash functions and I hash the same report, all seven hash functions need to give me a different index. None of them are allowed to give me the same index, a hash collision, as we would call it. So if I'm using k equals 7, 7 hash functions, because of their requirement to be pairwise independent, they will always give me 7 different indexes to set. Now, with Murmur, that's really easy to do. With, um, and I can refer to this because I use the Redis implementation and I looked at it. It depends on your implementation. You might build your own. I use the implementation provided with Redis. Redis has native support for Bloom filters. So that's all taken care of for me. I didn't make sure of that. You wanted the estimate on the number of distinct reports to be accurate. How expensive would it be to overestimate n? So overestimating n costs you space complexity. It makes the filter bigger. It does not alter the time complexity. Time complexity is largely controlled by k, the number of hashes that you need to do in order to perform an insertion or a query. So overestimating n basically just costs you more RAM. So given that we created our current filter at 8 gig and like the next logical step on DigitalOcean is a machine with 16 gig, we may as well just like whack the filter all the way up to you know, 15 gig or something. So we could hugely overestimate n. It's only ever going to cost you memory, storage space. Couldn't someone send random data to the report URI and thus fill your Bloom filter with ones? So yeah, like if we kind of take a step further back from that question, which is like the first part, couldn't someone send random data? That's a problem that we've been dealing with since day one. Report URI operates an API on the internet that's unauthenticated and allows you to just post data straight into our database. It's like the dumbest idea in the history of the world. Um, so we've been dealing with the problem of people sending us crappy data for a very long time. So like, yes, like the knock-on effect of having a balloon filter is that someone could try and overpopulate our filter by just sending us heaps and heaps and heaps of unique reports. But we have a lot of other processes and mitigations in place to stop people being jerks on the internet, because we know that there are loads of jerks on the internet. So yes, it is a viable concern, but we kind of solve that as a, a previous concern. When do you know you should reconfigure the balloon filter? A certain percentage of bits in the balloon filter set to one. So this is another really good question. There is, um, there is a method of calculating the, the population of the filter, as we call it. So you can look at the filter, look at the configuration parameters and how many bits are set, and from that you can estimate how many items are currently in the filter based on the probability of a bit having been set or not. So yes, you can run a calculation on the filter and guess the population of, like accurately guess the population of the filter. And then from that, you can determine is our false positive probability still accurate or not? Because if your filter is overpopulated, you know that you're going to be getting a lot more false positives. So you can use that calculation to say, you know, was I wrong and 7 billion was too small? <laughs> I need to go larger. Uh, when your balloon filter eventually fills up, how do you migrate data to a new, bigger one? You can't. Once a balloon filter has been created and you've started that insertion process, that is what you are stuck with. You cannot increase the size of the filter, neither the width nor the depth if you're on a sketch, because it would alter the queries and all items in there would be lost. So once you've started with a balloon filter, that's what you're going to be using. So you need to be reasonably accurate with N, like I said earlier. 
Is it possible to distribute the Bloom filter across multiple servers to continue scaling it? Um, yeah, there's no reason that you couldn't do that. You would have to do the insertions across all of the servers, I guess. But we just have one uh, centralized Redis cache on our internal private network, and all of our application servers talk to that. So there's no reason that you couldn't do that. But it would increase the time complexity of an insertion, because now you would need to pass it to you know, x number of uh, Bloom filters, however many you're operating. So I wouldn't do that, maybe. Maybe there's a scenario where it would make sense for you. But myself, I wouldn't do that. Now, there are still more questions. And people here may have questions. Thank you for asking them, but I'm out of time. So I'm going to be hanging around for the rest of the day. If you want to talk more about probabilistic data structures, uh, come and find me. I hope to see you all at the party tonight. Uh, thank you very much.